classes to get to that first day and, um, and to begin the work of learning around a really critical question, a genuine and authentic critical question together. So the theme for this year is, how does knowing content matter for disrupting the existence of oppression? Over the last two years, with you, and with a number of scholars and practitioners, we have worked to examine the entailments of teaching content in ways that deliberately disrupt inequities, focusing carefully on the nuanced enactment of high leverage teaching practice. And across this work, something that we noticed and that I'm sure you noticed as well, was that the scholars and practitioners with whom we worked, they consistently focused their elaborations of anti-oppressive teaching practice in examples that were grounded in disciplinary content. It is because of that that we um, settled on this theme for this year. So together this year, we will investigate the relationship between the special nature of knowing content and teaching and the work of seeing and hearing children's ideas of the subject matter and supporting that growth. We've invited a series of scholars to join us in considering the following sets of questions. What is involved in knowing and using content in ways that enable teachers to first hear children's ideas, to disrupt deficit narratives, to recognize those children's strengths, to see potential and resources in their families and communities, and to struggle with the canon in authentic ways, and second, to select and to design content and know it in ways that allow them to open up that knowledge and to better understand who is and who gets to make it. So building on those two questions together over the course of this year, we'll consider the implications of those answers for teacher education. And we'll ask again another question. How can we support our beginning teachers to learn content in ways that are internationally Together, we're going to investigate this set of questions over this year, and we are really, truly blessed um, to be beginning this journey together with Dr. Gloria Latson billings who joins us tonight as our keynote speaker. Her talk is titled, I hope we, have, we do have the correct title, is titled, The Social Funding of Race, The Role of Schooling. As the distinguished first speaker of this year's series, Dr. Latson billings will consider the questions I've just outlined, and will push and pull and enable us to see so much more in the way that we can imagine our answers together. So for those of you who've joined us before, you know that we really um, intend for this to be an authentic discussion with each other and with our speaker. And what that means is we really need you to be keeping track of your questions. So Dr. Ladson billings will speak for a bit. I hope that you spend some time, like as the questions percolate, as they you know, are raised in your mind, write them down and keep track of them um, so that at the conclusion of her talk, you can come up and ask a question at the microphone. We ask that you do ask your questions at the microphone so that the 300 plus people who are joining us um, online can hear your question, just like I hope they can hear my introduction um, right now. If you're watching online, you can email your questions to twseminar at umich.edu. You can use our Twitter hashtag TW Seminar, or you could post the Teaching Works Facebook page. You're, you could also do those things if you're in the room and you don't want to go up to the microphone. Um, we'll be live tweeting the seminar on Twitter with that same hashtag. And now it's my pleasure to invite Deborah Ball up to the stage to introduce Dr. Ladd. Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see this room full, and I know Um, 
seminar series. So I'm going to talk for just a couple of minutes. I know that this is definitely somebody who really doesn't need to be introduced to use that cliche, but I'm going to do it anyway. And I'm endeavoring to, in my few remarks, to see if there's anything I tell you you didn't already know. So just listen closely to see. It's also the possibility I'll say something that's not true. So we're not playing like two lies and a truth or whatever, but if I say anything that's not true, then when Gloria gets up, she can correct it. So I used various sources to do this. So um, beginning more formally, Gloria Ladson Billings is Professor Emerita. This is an important achievement of the last year and former Kellner Family Distinguished Chair of Urban Education in the School of Education at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. At Dr. Ladson Billings' work focuses, as many of us know, on culturally relevant pedagogy, critical race theory applications to education. She's held many important roles in our field, among them served as the president of the American Educational Research Association in 2005-06, during which, among many things that AERA accomplished, AERA moved to a new building, which is something uh, you might not have known, so I'll signal that that's a new thing for you. And she's the current president of the National Academy of Education. Um, she's, um, I think for all of us, a powerful thinker and scholar. Um, she's brought ideas to the field that are new, that have changed the field, have changed the way we think, changed the language that we use. And among them are things I've already mentioned, culturally relevant pedagogy, critical race theory, the way that we can use that in ways that are really in many spaces complementary to, but not the same as the ideas related to culturally relevant pedagogy. And of course, the very important talk she developed when she was the president of AERA that reframed the persistent talk about achievement gaps and gaps to be thinking instead about the debt, the education debt that is historical and systemic in our society and our history. Those ideas, among others, have changed the field, have changed the thinking, and it's a rare scholar who not only contributes to the growing of a field, but literally changes it and changes the terms of reference. Um, she's a dedicated and purposeful mentor, not only to her own students. Every time a student graduates who has been her mentee or has worked with her, you see just evidence of the ways in which she's invested in them, the way that they feel about the way she's helped them to flourish and to grow. But it isn't even just her own students, it's also people all across the field, students who graduate from other programs, students of students, students of colleagues, colleagues themselves who are mentored by Gloria. She's a dedicated and purposeful mentor thinking about not only individuals but how we change the field by who goes into the field, who gets encouraged to do the work, what kind of work gets supported and encouraged. She, for example, met generously with a class of mine here at the University of Michigan on campus for an hour last year using Blue Jeans technology, but it was though she was in the room, and I know some of you are here who are in that class, and we had a remarkable conversation about how the idea of culturally relevant pedagogy has evolved, been taken up in, in many ways, taken up in ways that weren't quite what was intended originally and what that has looked like over time and shared with us many candid think thoughts about how she thinks about work and its evolution, made more transparent to the students and, my, and me what it means to be a scholar who's always learning, always watching, always thinking about how to shape one's ideas. So that's what I mean by a mentor, a teacher. She's a leader, I already mentioned a couple of leadership roles that she's played, and in those roles not only led what is obviously activity of AERA or the National Academy, but also there too changed things, changed practice, Inter in, um, innovated with things that have to do with exactly what you could assume to be things that are critical, like who's actually occupying roles, what are kind of work are we doing, what are the activities, what are things that one does that change the structure of any of these institutions or organizations, not just add on little embroidery to them. So she's deliberate in everything that she does. There are also some things that she does that are deliberate in spaces that aren't quite so academic. So for example, she's um, a quite an enthusiastic sports fan. I'll leave it to you to f sort of figure out which sport that might be, but I have been in meetings with her where, while at the same time that she's paying close attention to everything that's happening, she's monitoring the progress of an unnamed team that wears red uniforms uh, across the course of a Saturday afternoon. I have watched that. And I will say that I do not think I've ever seen her rooting for any team that wears maize and blue, but maybe she, we can send her home with just a little maize and blue to wear in Madison. I don't know if she would do that, but she's also the grandmother of a star granddaughter basketball player, which is another very interesting phenomenon. It fits in the sports enthusiasm part of her world. She's also the first person I ever saw using one of those really pretty rubber keyboard covers 
that now are like the fashion. So I'm guessing maybe she started that trend. I don't have any evidence that it wasn't Gloria. I think it may have been. Um, she's deeply caring about individuals that go way beyond academics. In fact, in my first few moments with her here, we talked about a close friend of hers with whom she just had spent nine hours who had gotten some some unfortunate news and she was dedicated to them. I myself have experienced that in some very difficult periods of my life where we were having a conversation about something professional and very easily she was able to sort of open it up to thinking much more about me as a whole person. And I see that she does that with everybody. So this is a very expansive person, expansive in her thinking, expansive in her caring in the world, expansive in her generosity, and a really rare scholar, leader, mentor, friend, and we're really deeply fortunate that you agreed in your apparent retirement, which I'm still trying to figure out, to be willing to not only come and speak with us here, but to open the series this year. And we're all, as you can see, eager, ready to learn from you, eager to have our minds changed and provoked. So thank you so much for coming. Please join me in welcoming Gloria Letson Billings. Thank you, Deborah. What she didn't say is that we go all the way back to Michigan State days. You know, she pretend she pretended it was always maize and blue. <laughs> I remember. And also, thank you, Simona. And I'm going to attribute all those good skills of yours to the fact that you have good Wisconsin upbringing. She is a badger, right? So I'm going to do something that's going to make everybody crazy because I sent the slides and they put it in this nice format. But there was one slide I didn't send. And it's always my sort of beginning slide. So I'm going to slip this out for a minute. And then I'm going to put it all back if I can do it right. So let me do a few little things to... But if I don't do this, I'll be in, like in a lot of trouble. So, <laughs> so let's see. Have it in here. Are we getting it? No. So I have it plugged in. Uh-huh. I'm sorry to do that to you. That's fine. So just check your settings. Try to Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Okay. So again, I'm doing this because I'm required to do this by my family. <laughs> so I have to start with this page. Uh, on the left is our beautiful and talented uh, oldest grandchild, Monique Billings, who was drafted by the Atlanta Dream. And they just ended up losing in the conference finals to the Mystics who lost last night to the Storm. And then on the right is my next granddaughter who is a freshman at San Francisco State and is uh, a volleyball athlete. So that's done. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> so Simona, I'm going to ask you to kind of be the timekeeper because you saw at lunch I can go on and on and on and that's not good. And uh, let's see, do I have to go out of this and come back? Yes, okay. And then we'll go to slideshow. And so maybe if you give me maybe a five minute before I should be wrapping up so people could ask questions and I'll, I'll know what to do. Um, I actually sent you this paper, The Social Funding of Race, The Role of Schooling, that was published just this year in the Peabody Journal of Education. But I want to give you a little bit of a backstory because I have had this paper on my desktop since 2004. 
it has been a paper that has vexed me, but has stimulated me. It's made me really think about things over and over and over again in ways that I did not think possible. And in some ways, it's like your baby, you're protective, and you don't want people to say bad things about it. So it's like, don't even look at my baby, OK? <laughs> um, but the paper came as a result of the year that I spent at the Center for Advanced Studies in the Behavioral Sciences at Stanford. And the ideas just started flowing in a particular way. And I thought, you know, I'm going to write this paper. And most of us who are academics, our work is supposed to go like this, right? You're, you're supposed to develop a line of thinking and build and build and build and build, which is why in Deborah's class know, knew this, that there's nothing built off of my dissertation, OK? Because it was horrible. <laughs> horrible. Uh, so my work in culturally relevant pedagogy is actually a postdoctoral project. It's like, oh, I can finally stop thinking about that stuff. Um, so in this paper, um, what, what really happened with it, instead of doing this sort of build, and, which is what I was doing, and, you know, every paper, my, one of the earliest papers I published on culturally relevant pedagogy was a methodology paper where I was trying to think about how do you even think about this, and then the study got published, and the book got published, and then Bill Tate and I came together over the critical race theory piece. So it was a build, 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 but when I got this idea, it was like, oh my god, this is not building. This is starting over. So now, of course, I have a way to rationalize it. So my rationalization is, if you're kind of a Star Wars or a uh, Star Trek fan, you know how they give you the story? But you never drop in the story at the beginning. You know, when you get the story, everybody's sort of fully formed characters. and. They tell you a little bit about their background. And then once they hook you, like three or four movies in, they develop something called the prequel. <laughs> We're going to tell you how all this got started. <laughs> so I began thinking of this paper. This is the prequel. <laughs> this is the one that should have been in the front. <laughs> and it explains it all. So now I'm good, all right? Thank you, George Lucas. Thank you. <laughs> Steven Spielberg, now I have a way of thinking about how this story fits. So I called it the social funding of race, the role of schooling. And I start the paper with Strom Thurmond. And for those of you who don't know, back in 1948, Strom Thurmond ran for president of the United States. He's a senator from South Carolina. And his party at that time was called the Dixiecrats. They were staunch segregationists. And their argument was that the races should never mix, ever, 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 not through schools, not through uh, intimate relationships, that black people belonged over here and white people over here, and never the twain should mix. But at the same moment he's saying that, this man was having an illicit affair with a black woman who worked for his family. Now, I don't know what the, the, the terms of that relationship was and whether that woman had any say in that relationship. But what stunned me, it's not only did they have an affair, this woman on this, this is not the woman. That's the product of the relationship. That's his daughter. And throughout her life, he paid for stuff for her. He paid for her to go to college. She knew that was her dad. They had a relationship. So the, the question that came to mind for me is, how can you do something so perverse, right? On the one hand, you're talking about these, pe these are not really people. They're not equal to us. They're not worthy. They're not that. But I have this relationship with this person. And I don't walk away from it. I maintain a relationship with the offspring. So it's. It's, for me, it underscores just how crazy our notions about race are. That you could, you know, how do you keep these two things in your head? That you're saying these folks are not worthy, but at the same moment, this is my daughter, and I'm acknowledging her. So what I want to do is kind of talk about this preoccupation that I've had for a very long time, well before I came to the academy, around race. And one of the things we know that in the, in the US, 
our, the sociologists here uh, really have race as a central idea. Um, Howard Winant of Omi and Winant fame said, race is the central idea of American sociology. And I think that's interesting because it's not the central idea of British sociology. For British sociology, the central idea is class. And so in some ways, one of the things, the sort of tidbit I'll throw in here, is that your cultural context has an impact on your academic life and what it is you can think. So we live in a society that kind of denies the class differences because really the narrative is about how we're, not, you know, we're a classless society and everybody can make their way up. So you can't develop the discipline all around an idea that you don't want to acknowledge. And my colleagues in the UK, over and over, we have this debate about race and class. A wonderful colleague at the University of Birmingham, um, Nicola Rollick, has done a book on uh, the black middle class, where she basically demonstrates in the UK, blackness is also problematic. And that these kids are middle class, and if what you say about class is so, they should be moving in a particular way, and they're not. Their families are struggling too. So what I want to do is probably not going to clarify this race class distinction, but I want to think through it in a particular way about how we, quote, fund race in this society and how that funding contributes to a continual uh, inequitable and unjust and undemocratic processes in our schooling and in education in our country. So the argument is pretty much this way. First, we need to talk a little bit about race as a concept. Then we'll talk about this notion of funding and then how funding creates inequitable schooling and then the work of us as educators to defund race as a concept. So it's a big task. It's a relatively heavy lift, uh, but it's a lot of smart people in this room, and I think we'll, we'll, you'll push me further uh, in the end. So I'll start with the example of a court case, because you do realize that people literally have gone to court to sue to determine who is white in this country. Nobody's ever been to court to, to sue to determine who's black just doesn't happen. And it's so perverse that even, there's even a case in which the Finns, I don't know if you've been to Finland, but I have. The, these Finnish Americans sued because they were telling them they weren't white. So this particular case is the Hudgens case, Hudgens v. Wright, which is in 1806. And what happened is this man, um, there's a jurist by the name of Tucker who makes this decision, but it is a Mr. Hudgens who argues that these women that um, worked for him could be enslaved because they were black. And to determine whether they were black and thus slaves or Indian and allegedly free, the judge uh, in this case, and this was a Virginia case, uh, in indicated that in addition to skin color, there were two markers of blackness that endured over generations. So his quote says that nature has stamped upon the African and his descendants two characteristic marks besides the difference of complexion, which often remain visible long after the characteristic distinction of color either disappears or becomes doubtful. Flat nose, a woolly head of hair. And the latter of these disappears the last of all. So it's like, we're not going to lose this curl. That's the last thing that's going to go. It's so strong an ingredient in the African Constitution uh, that it predominates uniformly where the, where the party is in equal degree descended from parents of different complexions, whether whites or Indians. So in other words, if you, even if you have a white parent, your hair is still going to be curly, is what, what he's arguing. So by that standard, what happens is the judge looks at this long straight hair of Hannah Wright and judged her not to be of African descent. Therefore, she was free. This notion of race as a 
physical concept continues to pervade our thinking. So it's like we can tell who's what by looking at them. Now I had an experience, uh, I, I received an honorary degree this spring from the Erickson Institute at, uh, in Chicago. And I was talking to this woman the whole time who is one of the founders of the Erickson Institute. And she's 90 years old. And people were so deferential to her. Oh, when Barbara gets here, we can't do this before Barbara gets here. Oh, nobody's wearing a cap. They don't wear, you know, they head on gowns. Barbara doesn't like those caps, so we don't wear those caps. I mean, she was like the mover and shaker. And it was at a beautiful ceremony at the Field Museum in Chicago. And she and I were talking about grandchildren, of course. And she was telling me how proud she was of her granddaughter who had gotten a law degree. Uh, but she wasn't practicing law. Her granddaughter was a uh, journalist. She's a correspondent on CNN. She says, you know, I just drop everything whenever she's on. And she started telling me how she did. She said, you know, I've just indulged this child since she was a baby. And I've just bought her all these beautiful dresses and things. I couldn't do it for my own daughter because we were living in Iran, and they just didn't have those kind of clothes there. I thought nothing more of it, right? Uh, then later in conversation, she talked about her husband having graduated from Howard Med School. So I'm like, okie doke. So this white lady done married this black man. Okay. <laughs> but I didn't say anything more about it. And her husband had recently died, so she's talking about this problem of disposing of all of these medical school books and this, that. I mean, just a lot of stuff was happening in her life. Well, I went home, and I wanted to say, oh, she left the reception before I could thank her. That's what it was. And so I was trying to find her. So I, like we all do now, I went online to look her up. This woman was Valerie Jarrett's mother. <laughs> Iran, right? And she was not white. She was very fair. But she wasn't white. And so it's interesting that the things that I was putting in my head, oh, if your granddaughter's a journalist on CNN and your husband's a, a physician, I'm, I'm making her white because of sort of prefigured notions of who's in what category. So uh, we've often talked about race as a determinant of intellect. And I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, but this notion of Europeanness, whatever that actually means, is about having a sort of superior social identity. And I think it's really funny how we have come to this idea to decide that certain physical characteristics are what make for uh, racial identity and intellect. You know, when I was in graduate school, I, had a, I was on a project with the late Elizabeth Cohen. And Liz had us essentially identifying interactions between teachers and Latino students. Very simple task. We just sat in classrooms. Every time a teacher made any move towards a Latino student, we just made a check mark. Right? That's all we had to do. Well, there were some international students on our team. They could not determine who was Latino and who was not. And they were like, well, how are y'all doing this? You know, <laughs> you know, like, because they're like, we're running back and forth to the names of the kids. Maybe that'll help us. And I'm like, nope, nope, it doesn't work like that. We know who is and who isn't, right? I don't care if your hair is blonde and you got blue eyes. Hernandez, I see you. I see you, you know. <laughs> so then this, this question becomes, what is it about growing up in this environment that makes it so readily evil? make us so readily able to make these racial distinctions. Now, I think it's important to say that there are people in the field who are trying to move past this sort of notion of just uh, physical characteristics. And so I want to acknowledge the work of, of uh, Lonnie Guineer and Gerald Torres, who suggested that maybe what we really need to think about is political race. Let's, if, if we have to use it as a concept, Rather than the physical 
notions that we are saying this person is black and this is brown and this is red and this is yellow, it might be more, make more sense to say, here are the political resources this group needs. And so because they need it, this is the way in which they're going to deploy race to be able to get certain social benefits. But this, we, you know, we're stuck in this idea of heritability, that if your mother is black, then you're black, right? The person, I think, who, and it certainly is not, it doesn't show up in this paper because of when I started writing this paper, but the conundrum has always been, for me, is Barack Obama. Because quite frankly, his upbringing is more linked to the white side of his family. He grew up with white grandparents in Kansas. So the idea that, quote, he's black is really linked to our really narrow notions of, oh, because he has one parent who is black. Even though culturally, his upbringing, his growth, was as a kid in middle America, right? So to move from this concept of race, I started thinking about the idea of social funding. So I put my colleague, Deb Brandt. Deb used to be on the English faculty at Wisconsin because she has a concept called sponsors of literacy. And she argues in it is that the, the way that people learn to read and become literate is that people sponsor them. Now, it could be something as simple as your parents, right? They read to you, or, you know, or, or your grandparents that you get read to every night. And, and so they're sponsoring your literacy. And she'll say that a sponsor or any agents, local or distance, concrete or abstract, who enable, support, teach, model, as well as recruit, regulate, suppress, or withhold literacy. In other words, you learn literacy beyond just your little head. It could be that you watch a lot of TV, and I actually had a student who uh, was a second language learner when her family came here, and she said, you know, they always talk about you need to have a certain amount of books in your house. She said, we didn't have any books, because we couldn't, I, we couldn't read English. My parents were Spanish speakers, I was a Spanish speaker, but we had a TV. So for her, the television was the sponsor of literacy for her. And so I was just captivated by this notion of sponsoring literacy, and I liked her, 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 her point, but what really jump-started me in this idea of funding of race is a man by the name of Philip Fisher. Uh, Fisher work, is uh, a literature professor at Harvard and the partner of a woman named Elaine Scarry, who does work in aesthetics. And so one of the things that he had argued in, and I met him at the Center for Advanced Studies, and when he gave his talk, because we all have to give these talks, uh, he said, you know, when Americans walk into an art museum, they don't know what to do with what they see because we have no grammar for art. So here's what an American does in an art museum. They look at the picture for a few minutes, then they go read what it's about, right? <laughs> because, and this is when he dropped it, because literacy is fully funded. Art is not. And, and I just had that aha moment. I'm like, and so is race, right? That there's a way in which you, we use literacy even, even when we're being outside of the, the culture, even when we're being antisocial, we use literacy. You know, the passing of the notes. Now it's the tweeting, right? We, we, a texting, you know. You suppose we pay attention to the teacher. I'm not interested in the literacy lesson, but I'm going to use literacy, right, to tell my friend, this ain't about nothing, is it, right? Or I'm so far out of the society, uh, I'm going to rob a bank, I'm going to take a note in there, right? I'm going to write something down and tell them, give me all the money. Uh, I'm a, I was a huge Woody Allen fan. And one of my favorite Woody Allen movies is Take the Money and Run. And in that film, he goes to the bank with the note. It says, I have a gun. Uh, give me all the money in your cash drawer. And the woman looks at it. The teller goes, I have a gub. What is a gub? <laughs> so he says, no, 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 it's a gun. 
She said, it's not, it says guh. And so she arguing back and forth with him. And then at one point he goes, the, the, the teller goes to her bank manager and says, what does this say? And the bank manager says, I have a gub. Please open it. What's a gub? I mean, so this whole discussion in this ridiculous scene is about the literacy, right? That, that if you're going to rob the bank, at least have the words right, right? That, that, that we all participate in uh, literacy. It's, 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 as Fisher says, it's fully funded. So much so that if you were to walk down the street and you were confused about where you were going, you could ask somebody, like maybe you have the address on your phone, do you know where this is? And it would not be seen as strange. People would say, oh, no, oh, you're, you're, you're over here, but really, you really need to be in such and such place. You will not stop anybody in the street to solve an equation. OK? That doesn't happen. We're not, we don't fund other areas of content in the same way. So that notion of funding really um, struck me. And I thought about, well, if we're funding literacy, how are we funding race? So it's, no, it's never a bad idea to go back to Toni Morrison. And she had argued that race has become metaphorical. It's a way of referring to and disguising forces, events, classes, and expressions of social decay uh, and economic division far more threatening to the body politic than biological race ever was. So it's not that we don't have human differences, but what we have made race mean has become something so detrimental. So I tell this story of my daughter being in preschool. Now what you need to know, it's not in the paper, but what you need to know, um, we were living in Palo Alto. And I didn't know you're supposed to put your child on the list for preschool as soon as the thing on the stick says plus. <laughs> you know, I'm like, you know, you let them grow up a little bit, and then when it's the year before you want them to go, you go to the school. And so when I got there, they were like, oh, gee, you're, you're just too late. And I was very deliberate in the kind of preschool I wanted my child to go to. I did not want any preschools that were teaching reading or mathematics. I just, I just needed to get her civilized. That's all I want. I want her to learn that there are other people in the world, and you need to know how to get along with them. The reading said, it'll come. You're three. Why are we worried about that? So I had colleagues who were surprised that I hadn't taken her to the Stanford uh, Bing, you know, where they do all the research. I'm like, nope, I don't want none of them people around my child. <laughs> uh, I just, I just want to have some fun and learn how to get along. But so I chose a friend school, which is a whole other thing. Fred Erickson and I go on and on about the passive aggressive nature of the friend. So because uh, they won't argue, you know, they just won't, you know, but. They're making you crazy, you know. And so the conditions under which she could go, because I had waited too late, was that if I would be a participating parent, one day a week I had to come. So I said, okay, I'll do it as long as you don't make me do anything with her. I will do this. So they're like, no, 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 you, you, we'll have stuff for you to do. So I'm playing with this little boy, and there are only two black children in the preschool. My daughter and uh, another little, uh, little boy. And this little boy, who is actually a recent immigrant from northern Italy, says to me while we're, he and I are at the art table making something, and he says, which one is yours? Because the two black kids were playing together. Now, I thought that was a perfectly logical request or question from this child. But there was a tension in the room from the other adults, all of whom were white, that he would make the distinction. And I said to him, oh, um, the girl, Jessica, that's my daughter. And he was fine with the answer, and we went on doing what we were doing. But a few weeks later, he showed up in school, and he had a beautiful handmade sweater on. And I admired it. And I said to him, I said, oh, Mario, that's such a beautiful sweater. I said, where'd you get that? 
He said, my grandmother made it. And she made one for my sister. And she made one for my mother. And she made one for my dad. And she sent it to us from Italy. And I said, you know what? I'm going to have to come and live at your house so I can get me one of these sweaters. And he said, you can't live at my house. There are no brown people at my house. Again, I see this three-year-old making an observation. The difference between red balls and blue balls, right? But when he said that, the adults in unison said, oh, Mario, <laughs> that's not nice. And so what I argue is this youngster does not have race funded for him in the same ways that, quote, American kids do. But by the time he's maybe in third grade, he will have been sanctioned enough times, just like in that moment, that he'll start to get it. Oh, you can't talk about that. You can't say that. You got to pretend like you don't see no difference. You got, you know, you know, we just Americans. I mean, all of that is going to be funded for him so that he will learn the conventions. I give another example from. Uh, another immigrant child. This little girl, uh, father was a visiting scholar at Stanford, and they became our next door neighbors. Father spoke English, the mother's English was not very um, strong, and the little girl was just learning. Because now, now we're five year olds, so we're in a regular kindergarten class. And this little girl and my daughter become fast friends. Um, they live next door to us, they're in the same classroom. And in some ways, my daughter is like her protector because she's explaining the world to her. We help the family. We help them get their, uh, help them with DMV and get their electricity on. So those kinds of just common everyday knowledge, we are helping them with. And I don't include it in this paper, but I think it's really important just to share with you because it's an example of even someone like me who cares about the way in which race makes its way I participated in it too. Every day after school, this little girl came to play with my daughter after she'd had lunch. And I expected her, she shows up. And so she came in one day and she said to me, where's the white Barbie? Oh, I said, oh baby, I don't have any white Barbie. <laughs> you know? And she says, as a five-year-old would say, why? And I said, you know, I just don't think she'd be all that comfortable living here. <laughs> Why? Well, I don't think that she would, you know, what we eat she probably wouldn't like. And I know she doesn't like the music I'd be playing. And she, you know, I'm, I'm making this, you know, I'm trying to be right about this. And everything that I said to her ended with, Somewhere in the midst of this and me getting really exasperated but still coming up with pretty good reasons why a white Barbie <laughs> wouldn't be happy at my house, she says, oh, there she is. There's the white Barbie. At which moment I become the exorcist. <laughs> like my, my head is spinning. Who bought white Barbie in my house? You know? You know, the two things I don't have is I don't have any white Barbie that had no guns. You know, those, those things my kids just couldn't have. It. And so I'm thinking, who gave her a white Barbie? But guess what? It was a black Barbie. She was in a wedding dress. That was white Barbie for this child who has not had race funded for her in the same way, but even my behavior is now saying, oh, it's something more than that dress. There's something else that she's doing and signaling to me. So we move away, and uh, the family's devastated because we were like their confidants and helping them with things. But a year later, they moved to the Midwest. The father gets an appointment at a university in the Chicago area, and they're excited, and they call, and they want to get the girls together over Christmas and so they go skiing and then I bring them back to my house and she stays over and I'm listening to a conversation and the little girl describes herself as yellow and my daughter says and this is the difference between five and now about almost seven or eight uh, my daughter says to her yeah but when we were in California you said you were white 
And the little girl says, and with a voice that I'm not sure I could uh, emulate, yeah, I didn't know. So I'm wondering, what has happened to her in these two intervening years where she may have identified herself because her skin color is fairer as white? How many times was she sanctioned? How many times was she told, you're not white. You don't get to be in that category. That's not who you are. That is the funding, right, that she is learning over and over. There is a distinction about who I am and which group I fit in. I refer to David Rodiger's work because David Rodiger says that even growing up in an all-white community, race was never absent. It's still there. You don't have to have people of a different race for you to be talking about them and signaling them and determining who's in which category. And so when I first started thinking about this uh, particular essay, I was watching the then National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, testify before the 9-11 Commission. And you know whether you like her and the policies that she was supporting or not, if you looked at that one presentation, she did a great job. She never got riled. She didn't rise to the bait. She answered their questions. She stayed calm and she stayed cool. And as I was watching this, because I was in the midst of thinking about this, this work for this paper, I was wondering, OK, is this, going, this social funding of race, is it going to show up here? Well, sure enough, when the commentaries, after she had given her talk, uh, came up, the first thing one of the broadcasters said was, National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice was so articulate. Okay, she's the National Security Advisor. I mean, and I'm wondering, where else would that come up? Would you say that about the Secretary of Defense? Would you say that? You know, and sure enough, it had been said of Colin Powell because I started digging. So it's this idea that we are signaling to people, we don't expect much from certain groups of people. So when they do something that we think is uh, meritorious, we'll make a comment about it that, again, I never said that, that she was black. I didn't say she was articulate for a black person. But just the way that I signaled it by saying, oh, she was so articulate, uh, a statement that was always attached to Barack Obama. Uh, it's, again, it's funding this concept of race for people who, without even talking about race, we're starting to get some ideas about how race is functioning. Um, our tendency is to think about race in a dichotomous ways, that things are either black or white, right or wrong, good or bad. But I think when the subject is race and racism, we quickly default to these are the racists and these are the non-racists. That, you know, the worst thing you can say about somebody is that they're racist because we already decided, oh, you're putting me with this group as opposed to that group. And an analogy that I tried to use as I thought through this paper is an experience that I had in Sweden. Uh, there's this northern city that my graduate students and I have spent time in called Umeå. And it has what's called an art trail. And what you do is you drive from place to place to place to see public art. And one of the pieces, um, it can best be described as a wood-fired heated stone bench. It's like a, made of bricks, and it's a bench. And, you, and on one end, um, you, you, there is a furnace like. So at the bottom of the bench, you, they, people put wood uh, in it. And so if you were sitting on the bench, some sections of the bench are comfortable because the heat is more evenly distributed, usually around the middle of it. Some of the sections are really hot. If you're closer to where the wood goes in, those sitting there is going to be hot. And some are cool if you're further away from that. And what was unique about the bench was uh, the public was both invited to sit on the bench, but also encouraged to open the lid at the end of the bench and place another fire log on it before leaving. So you sit on it, you kind of observe it, and then before you leave, you're supposed to put some logs in, make sure that there are enough logs in to keep it warm. So as visitors, we benefited from the previous visitors' efforts to keep the bench warm. 
And then we maintain the warmth by putting another log on the fire. I think the way that the social funding of race operates is similar to that bench. It's already warm when we enter this society. We're invited to sit upon it, share its benefits, and we are encouraged to add fuel to it as we move on. We didn't construct the bench, but we take responsibility for maintaining it. Some of us are sitting on a section of the bench that's cold. We're excluded from the benefits. Others are sitting on a section that's too hot. We are victimized by the very thing that brings others pleasure. And although this may be kind of a crude analogy, I think it helps to illustrate the ways that we might be unwillingly participating in a process that we believe benefits us without being aware of the way it regularly and systematically disadvantages others. So what does all this mean for schools? So I've argued that race is fully funded in our society. But of course, as an educator, I want to know what such funding means for schools and particularly in classrooms. So we know that schools have been grappling with this issue of bringing unequal status groups of learners together for a very long time. Uh, I believe Cherry Banks does a great job of documenting the work of community and school-based groups to incorporate immigrants, particularly European immigrants, uh, into the mainstream and later to extend these efforts to non-white communities. But as important as the intergroup movement was, and as benevolent as its founders and activists may have been, I think it's important to understand that their major purpose was to assimilate the other into what they firmly believed was the superior culture. I'm trying to get you into white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture. Um, but the school has always been a site of citizenship and human rights contestation for centuries. Um, I think at its highest level, U.S. society, uh, the inclusion and exclusion of particular groups of students from school or school that represents access to social mobility has been a major site of conflict. Even though we said we want to have these schools so that everybody can participate, it's been that place where the conflict has been uh, so public. And it's also been commingled with race. So, of course, the landmark Supreme Court decision of Brown versus the Topeka Board of Education in 1954, while ostensibly about defunding race in order to create equal education, it really wasn't about that. It's really about foreign relations and the process of selling democracy to other nations. You have to remember the context in which Brown emerges. It's Cold War, and there are non-aligned nations and the then Soviet Union is fighting to bring nations into its orbit, and the US is doing the same thing. One of the weapons that the Soviet Union had was the inhumane and unequal treatment of black people in the society. So all, these political cartoons are all around the world saying, oh, they want you to align with you? Look at what they do to their own citizens. So Brown becomes this important linchpin not about schools, but about showing these other nations, no, 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 we've come further than that. So often in the critical race theory literature, you see Brown as a foreign policy strategy, not as an education strategy. So I want to explore some of the aspects of schooling that I think are uh, exemplars of what the funding means in schools. So one of them is the whole issue of access to equal education. We are 60 years past Brown. And what we've seen, however, is continued white resistance to school desegregation. We've seen the displacement of black teachers and administrators. And we've seen the resegregation that exists that compounds race and poverty. So now what's really important is, is not merely that uh, we had racial desegregation now we have what Gary Orfield and his colleagues call hypersegregation. So if you are both poor and black or poor and brown, you are much more likely to be attending a school with kids just like you. And so it is that concentration of race and poverty, uh, not merely 
uh, school desegregation. Uh, I think I'm going to skip over parts of, uh, of, of, of the paper that talk a little bit about uh, how the Republican Party built a solid South, but it really is around race. It's, and it's not Ronald Reagan. It's Richard Nixon. You go back and see that Nixon was adamant that we are going to reverse Brown. And that's what kind of drew that moved the South from a, a, almost a solid Democratic Party to a solid Republican Party. Um, and we do know that large urban school districts can be described as hypersegregated. Clearly, Detroit is hypersegregated. Philadelphia, Dallas, Memphis, Baltimore, Houston. Uh, whenever we talk about school achievement, we're almost always talking about those top 25 largest districts that are hyper-segregated. The other place where, uh, oh, and I did want to share that uh, language has a lot to do with this. So the notion of an urban school or an inner city school conjures up visions of black and brown children. As soon as you say that, we think of certain kids in these schools. And I wanted to illustrate the power of language and its use as a racial tool. Uh, there was a school naming debate that took place in Riverside County, California, and back in 1998. Just before the Martin Luther King holiday, the school board decided to name the new high school after the American hero and civil rights leader, Martin Luther King. School would serve a primarily white, upper middle income community. I know Riverside County. My oldest granddaughter is from Riverside County, right? But at the school board meeting, a number of the parents protested about the naming of the school. A person by the name of Dale Dunn stated, quote, Martin Luther King was a great man, but naming the school after him would be a mistake. Everybody will think we have a black school out there. So my question is, what does he mean? What is a black school? And what disadvantage did he imagine his children might suffer from such a designation? How had indeed the naming of a school after a national hero become a site of racial fear? The second area that the where funding matters is in curriculum. We know that the school's advertised curriculum can be another site for social funding of race. What intellectual information and experiences students have access to, what they are denied access to, what distortions of information they encounter can serve as powerful funders of our racial ideology. Uh, many scholars have done content analysis of curriculum texts to determine the degree to which various groups and perspectives are represented in the information and materials that school children receive. We also know that textbook examination uh, work offers quantitative analysis of how many instances of various people and groups. But I also want to consider the qualitative issues about that representation. Anybody who's ever worked for a textbook company knows, like, it, talk about making sausage. You really don't want to see how this happens, right? <laughs> um, but it is often about just counting. Do we have enough black people in here? Do we have enough Latino people here? Do we have enough American Indian uh, folks represented? And Joyce King had made a typology or proposed a typology that moves us away from the just counting and talking about the quality of who's there. Right? So she has these terms where she says we can move from hegemony to autonomy uh, as we think about how we, we uh, organize the curriculum from invisibilizing knowledge to marginalizing knowledge to expanding knowledge and then finally to what she terms deciphering knowledge. So invisibilizing knowledge focuses on that sort of monocultural depiction of the society when we use terms like we and our to signal a notion of common interests, even while there's kind of a simultaneous silencing of the interests of the socially excluded. But this is a type of curriculum that elevates the achievement of the West over all others. So if you, you know, my, my area is social studies and history, so there's a way in which we can talk in this invisible lies knowledge when we say we. Um, 
I went with my family to Disney World because I like amusement parks. And, you know, Disney might have, it might be crap, but it's going to be high quality crap, right? <laughs> you know, this is not cheap crap. You know, they spend a lot of money on that stuff. Uh, so we go over to Epcot. And if you've been there, you know, there's all these pavilions that sort of stereotypically represent being in Japan, being in India. But I, you know, I was a US history major. I want to go to the American Pavilion. So we go to the American Pavilion. At this time, my daughter's like eight years old. So we go and we are greeted by the Voices of Liberty. And there are women in big petticoats, you know, and men in the waist, waist coats and the top hats, and they're singing the songs of freedom. Okay. They're all white people singing the songs of freedom, but they sing it, right? So that's how they escort you in. And then you get in, and you are in an auditorium, and you hear the story of America, like a 30-minute presentation. And it starts with, we came into the West. OK, let's stop right there. <laughs> Woo-hoo! And untamed, uninhabited, uncivilized vastness. And I'm sitting there saying, are they still talking this Frederick Jackson? Turn the crap, you know. But it really, it, it's the story. In the whole presentation, there's one black person. It is Frederick Douglass who comes across in a, a rowboat in a three-piece suit. I mean, I'm, I'm just having a problem <laughs> right there. Dude, you in a suit in a boat. <laughs> and there's one woman, and it's Susan B. Anthony. And she's looking like she's crazy, right? She's, because she's ranting. It's so jingoistic that at the end of the presentation, and there were a lot of international visitors, because people come from all over the world to go to Disneyland and Disney World, that there was this hesitation where people didn't know if they were even supposed to clap. It was like, yikes, <laughs> right? But more important for me as a parent, my eight-year-old turns to me and says, well, mom, where were we? That's the invisibilizing knowledge. You think you've heard the story of America. Now, what happens whenever we've gone back, I've wanted to go to the, the, uh, back to see if they changed anything. And my family's like, we are not going there with you. You're just going to have to go by yourself. Uh, they have changed some stuff. They got some black people singing in the Voices of Liberty now, right? <laughs> But it's like the story is told in a particular way because it's such a good story told in that way. Why would you want to mess it up with all of this nasty stuff like slavery and uh, discrimination against women and the genocide of American? That's, that's, oh, that's, that's a ooky story, right? The good story is we came into the West. And so that Marginal, that invisibilizing knowledge is literally what many of our kids are still experiencing in their curriculum. The marginalizing knowledge in the curriculum can include some selected multicultural curriculum, but it's distorted. So you still have examples of our common culture, right, that then translates everyone exper everyone's experience into the immigrant experience. You know, we no longer all came over on the Mayflower, the biggest boat in the history of the world. No, we're not all on the Mayflower anymore. Now we're all immigrants. So everybody has either had an Ellis Island experience or an Angel Island experience on the West Coast. But then what happens to American Indians? They now become first immigrants. At least that's the way it's written in the curriculum. And they're like, no, we, we were already here. We weren't immigrating from anywhere. And then black people are called forced immigrants. OK, that's the oxymoron. <laughs> you making me come. I'm not immigrating, right? And I often have laughed and said, then I guess our Latino brothers and sisters are the synthetic immigrants, because they got made here, right? It's, it's, you've distorted the language and the concept because you want to fit it into a particular ideology, and that's kind of the marginalizing knowledge. The expanding knowledge is often what we've all fought for because you at least are including more voices and more people. But 
the problem with expanding knowledge is that it rarely disturbs or interrogates the legitimacy of the hegemonic European can canon. You just add more people. But you never say, well, why did they do this? Uh, I often remember you know, sitting and learning about a sort of textbook discussion of slavery. And it always made me feel like, what's wrong with black people? that they ended up as slaves. It's not until I began becoming a history, student of history and as a history major that I began to ask a different kind of question. And that was, what in the world is wrong with Europeans that they would think that this is an OK thing to do? But what it was is if you went back to look at the history of Europe, that the entire feudal system is built on this, that you exploit people, that you take their rights. This is, it wasn't a new thing. But we never phrase the question that way so that our students can think differently about who they are and how they came to be a part of this. And then finally, King addresses what she terms deciphering knowledge. And that's designed to expose the belief structure of race in literature and school texts and other discursive practices. In some ways, this pulls on Foucault's notion of the archaeology of knowledge. It's, it's this whole idea of regime of truth. How do we even begin to think like this? And so you stop looking for not just what's there, you look for what's not there. Um, in the deciphering knowledge, the problem with Huckleberry Finn is, well, uh, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn is not Huck's use of the N-word. That's not the problem. What you have to struggle with if, if you are trying to decipher this is why an adult black male is made serviceable and childlike vis-a-vis -vis an adolescent indigent white boy. That's, that's the deciphering thing. How does this little white boy get to ask a grown man these kinds of things, right? Or if you're reading The Tempest or The Heart of Darkness, we have to help our students understand the way race, and specifically blackness, is prefigured as degradation, as savagery. So the curriculum is, is that site of contestation that you know, you're working in a project in which you're looking at the way in which content uh, contributes to oppression, way content keeps things in place. It's getting to that place of deciphering that will be your challenge, asking that next question. Of course, instruction is kind of my wheelhouse, because it's not just the curriculum that explains how schools participate in the social funding of race. It's also how we teach. Uh, it's implicated by the way that teachers arrange their classrooms, the way we group our students, things like ability grouping or things like uh, advanced placement and honors and remediation. My middle son uh, is a teacher, is a social studies teacher, so he's the smart one in the family. <laughs> he's not making the most money, but he's still the smart one. Uh, and his first year teaching, he was still living in the Palo Alto area, and he was teaching at a high school that, if you've seen Dangerous Minds, right, uh, it's in that district. I mean, they, that, that woman's story is a true story, Luann Johnson, and I know what high school she's at. And so he's in that district, and that school has the same program that the Dangerous Mind has. If you, if you watch Dangerous Minds, what you can miss is that's a middle class school. They just put her kids that are bust into this academy program. So they're down in the basement, segregated from the rest of the school. But those kids in the rest of that school go on to, to, to college. So my son was working in this same program, interesting enough, uh, team teaching with Marion Wright Edelman's son, Josh. And I said, well, what are you teaching? He said, algebra 0.5. I said, what? What is that? He said, well, we take the entire year to teach one semester of algebra. OK, let me tell you how very wrong all of this is. The first place where it's wrong is I did tell you he was a social studies teacher, did I? <laughs> so why are you teaching anybody any algebra? But number two, what is a semester of algebra in an entire year going to do for these kids? What are they prepared to do? 
but it has to do with the re disregard that they have for this group of kids. So this notion of um, some kids are entitled to this and some kids are not is very, very uh, prevalent in our schools. And so what we teach, and so all of the work that I've tried to do in culturally relevant pedagogy has really been about the instruction. Uh, I've seen great teachers receive from their districts or from their schools really horrible curriculum and essentially, in my words, spin straw into gold, constantly interrogating the text. I was in a classroom where the teacher, uh, there's a statement in their, in their uh, world social studies book uh, that said, the people of Nigeria are traditional and primitive. And that's what it said in the book. But then the teacher stops and begins to show some slides of Lagos, Nigeria and ask the kids, where do you think this is? And they're guessing, oh, that's Tokyo. Oh, that's probably a Scotland. I mean, they're just coming up with names. And after she's shown them these series of, of slides, she says, no, every last one of those are cities in Nigeria. OK, so you got this information in your text. And I just showed you some slides. What questions do you want to ask about this? Why are they lying to us? Why are they tell us this? <laughs> Okay, that's exactly the process of the deciphering that is happening, but, but she has the instructional skill to do that. I've also seen people have high quality uh, text or content and still really be pushing inequity in the midst of it. Again, an example from my daughter. My daughter was in sixth grade and uh, participating in the math in context curriculum. Now, I know this is good curriculum. My, my neighbors in, at work, my next door office mate, developed this curriculum. This is good stuff, right? I mean, he's, he's the hot stuff in mathematics education. So it's about really helping kids think more conceptually about mathematics, not just doing pages of, uh, you know, computation, right? They're, they're, they're thinking conceptually. So the task is to make a toothpick bridge with 100 toothpicks. And the, tooth, the bridge has to be able to sustain their math book. It has to be strong enough, sturdy enough, that they can put their math book on it without the bridge collapsing. Oh, great idea, great concept. And the teacher's response to, to make it an equitable assignment is to give everybody 100 toothpicks, right? So each kid gets a baggie with 100, and you go home and make your bridge. So first I say, well, here, I'm going to tell you how this is inequitable. Because I got a box of 250 toothpicks right over here at home. And so I can make a prototype. And if it doesn't work, I make another one with your 100, right? But the truth of the matter is that a toothpick bridge is not about the toothpicks. It's about a hot glue gun. <laughs> and if you don't have a hot glue gun, you're not in the game. You cannot make a toothpick bridge with Elmer's. <laughs> not, not possible. My daughter calls me from school. Mom, can you stop by Joanne Fabrics and get a toothpick, uh, get a, um, a hot glue gun? Now, I'm not a crafty type person, so I'm like, okay, I'll go over there and pick it up. But it also means that I have to have the woman instruct me on how to use this thing. You know, anything with gun doesn't resonate with me. But, but she teaches me how to use it. So I can go home with the hot glue gun. She has kids in her class who cannot make that phone call. Or if they make it, the answer is maybe on Friday when I get paid. But I can't do it today. So now here's my daughter at home with two college-educated parents 350 toothpicks, the 100 from school, and the 250 I got in the drawer. We got the new hot glue gun. We're all working on the toothpick bridge. But I got a colleague in civil engineering. <laughs> so I called up the duck. How are we supposed to make this thing? I also have high speed internet. I'm on the toothpick bridge. <laughs> we make the prototype. It didn't quite work, but we got more information. 
Now we have made the toothpick bridge. It's sturdy enough to sustain the math book. I say to my daughter, listen, go to bed because you have an early bus to catch. We've been at this for a while. My husband interjects, bus? You're not taking my toothpick bridge on no bus. <laughs> so, so now we're all invested in this. He understands that a bunch of sixth graders and a toothpick bridge on a bus is not a good thing because everybody's going to say, let me see yours, let me see yours. It's going to get broken. So now you've got to have an adult with the kind of job that is flexible enough to drive you, which is what he did. So he drives, and when, I got, when, he, when he came home, I got home that evening, I said, so how did it go? He said, oh, it was good. Some people had theirs on a the board. Uh, some people had some little trees. We could have done that. You know? <laughs> so, so, so now this is this whole parent engagement. But what's the point of the bridge? See, my sense from the assignment is that the kids are supposed to learn that triangles are reinforcing structures. And so when I shared this with the teachers about how upsetting I felt this was, they were, well, what could we have done? I said, you know, I don't know if you ever get to full equity on some of this stuff, but you've got to try to get closer. So what, what if you had a bank of hot glue guns, you had the toothpicks, and the assignment becomes go home and design a bridge? And then here, we're going to see if your design actually works. So I worry that we're no longer assessing what kids know. We're assessing what they have. And there are kids in my daughter's class who are equally as smart, if not smarter than she is, but they don't have two college-educated parents, one of whom works at a university with a college of engineering and high-speed internet and a hot glue gun. I had all of that to make my daughter look like she knew something, which may or may not have been the case. I want to hurry along because I'm going to try to stop, make sure I stop at 5.30. Uh, discipline and classroom management is a clear place we see the social funding of uh, race in schools. I've been in schools where schools have been proud to show me a room full of little black boys sitting in rows with their hands folded, and the person who is supervising them is an instructional aide. There's no instruction happening. They're just sitting. Uh, this was called the restitution room, right? And I had a principal who was really proud to show it to me. And he says, well, what do you think? And I said, well, I think it's great if what you're preparing them for is prison. Because that's the only place you have to just sit and do nothing. Over and over again, we see examples of uh, black kids, in particular, being suspended for what Majors and Bilson calls non-contact violations. They had a hat on in the building. They had some other band attire. They're in a wrong place at some place in the school, some in the wrong hallway. Uh, these kinds of infractions, and, and actually it's the Justice Department, uh, Office of Civil Rights has shown us over and over that black children get suspended for things that other kids don't. You may have uh, seen the, the report that came out talking about black preschoolers. And so I did get to meet this young woman, Tunette Powell, whose children have been uh, suspended from preschool. She had three and a four-year-old. They've been suspended from preschool eight times. Preschool. And it's interesting to me what the violations were, that somehow the three-year-old had hit the teacher. I don't know about you, but I'm sorry. I'm waiting for the, to see the three-year-old that could hit me that it would matter. Right? I'm not saying he should do it. What I'm saying is Part of what we should know about the development of three and four-year-olds is that the one place that they really want to be is at home with mommy. And if the only way I can get there is acting a fool, guess what? I'm going to act a fool. No one said to a three-year-old, I know you want to go home. I know you want to be with your mom. But for right now, for this time, we're going to be together. You can throw things, you can scream, you can holler, but we are going to be together until it's time for you to leave. Once that's made clear, 
then you get a diff this kid is, is trying to get a need met. And in his mind, the need is meeting with the parent, is being with his parent. I was observing a student teacher, and I noted that she had reprimanded an African-American child um, nine times. Excuse me, an Asian-American child nine times. This kid kept getting up out of his seat. Stanley, sit down, Stanley. Go back to your seat, Stanley. I mean it, Stanley. Sit down, Stanley. Nine times. After the ninth time, an African-American boy got up, Larry, and her remark was, you're out of here. Now, I showed it to her because of the way in which I take my observation notes. I have what the teacher does on one side and what the, te and the students do on the other, and I have the times. And when I sh she, she was shocked. She said, oh, my God. I don't know why I did that. That's back to this social funding. It's so deep inside of us that we are doing and acting in ways that until someone shows it to us, we would deny it. We would say, oh, no, I don't do that. I'm fair to all of the kids. Uh, an assessment, of course, is one of the places that this social funding shows up. We keep using tests as a proxy for student learning without any consideration of the differential challenges that kids are uh, focused, you know, are exposed to. Um, of course, all the work of Claude Steele is really about this notion of stereotype threat is the way in which if you think your group doesn't perform well on something, that clouds your performance. And we know that we're, we're um, setting up these stereotypes the stereotype threat over and over again. Uh, we have things that we talk about, and it's not just race. Um, Claude talked about going down to uh, Google, right? And he said, you know, I, am, I have a pretty strong self uh, concept. Here I am, a endowed professor at Stanford. My career has gone well. He said, but I got in that room, and I was the only one with gray hair. And he said, I couldn't focus on nothing they were saying. I drove down there, and there are bicycles hanging all around because everybody rode their bike to work. I'm the only one in a tie. He said, I could not focus on the meeting because I kept thinking, I'm the old guy here. I don't know any of this stuff they're talking about. You know, every two minutes they got their devices and their, you know. And so, yes, the stereotype threat can happen in, around race, around class, and around gender around age, around ability, but it is quite pernicious around race because we're constantly saying that these kids don't do well on X, Y, or Z. And so we see it happening all the time. Teachers tend not to be surprised when black kids don't do well uh, because we've come to think of it as normative. Of course they don't do well. And we have a whole series of explanations for why they're not doing well. So I want to wrap up by talking about teacher education, because if these areas of curriculum and instruction and discipline and classroom management and assessment are played out um, through race, what can we do? If we're trying to prepare the next generation of um, teachers. So I think it's you know, true that Few teacher educators take on race directly. I can point out a couple of teacher education programs that do, but as a part of this is how we pre prepare our teachers, uh, we don't see a lot of that. Um, the teacher educators who want to do this work, I think, represent some of the more committed members of the academy to, they want to dismantle racism. But if we think about the work that race and racism is doing in the society, you can see why it's such a difficult task. Um, Tim Wise, who is a well-known anti-racist, uh, tells the story of his elderly grandmother who had spent her entire life fighting racism and injustice. So passionate was she about those commitments that she challenged her own father, who was a southerner and a member of the Ku Klux Klan. She told her father, you got to choose between me or the Klan. You can't have both. Uh, and all of Wise's grandmother's civic work was aimed at eradicating racism. And it probably had a major impact on the kind of person he would become. 
However, as her mind began to deteriorate with age, and the family placed her in, uh, in convalescent care, Wise was shocked to experience the depths in which what he calls racist socialization uh, had taken place in everybody, including his grandmother. He said his grandmother could no longer remember the names of her children or her grandchildren. She could not do the simple everyday task of feeding herself. She couldn't carry on a coherent conversation. But there was one thing that remained present for her. She looked upon her convalescent home attendants, almost all of whom were African American, and she regularly called them using the society's most despised pejorative, inward. So he points out that our thoughts and feelings about race are so deeply embedded in our psyches and appeals to uh, reason regarding racism are unlikely to undo this work that race, that the culture has done to establish it. This woman gave her entire life to anti-racist causes, and now she was in her head, left in her head, and she's still using this word. So what he calls racial socialization is what I think of as funding. And I see funding as a more global construct that speaks to the direct and indirect benefits that accrue or fail to accrue to members of our society. If the society decides to fund its military and not fund social welfare, that funding decision has implications for everybody in the society. So that's why I say we're all implicated in this funding. It is not as if the people who disagree with that funding priority are somehow outside of the resultant social and international fallout. You can't say, oh, I withhold this portion of my taxes because you're building a bomb with that. No, if they built the bomb and they dropped the bomb and we're at war, you still get the blowback whether you wanted to participate or not. Uh, and I focused a lot on the symbolic and the social and psychological components of race in, in what I've had to say. Uh, but, and it's been deliberate, but I'm also trying to show the symbolic. Because even when the, excuse me, even to show the structural, because even when the structural barriers are removed, the social funding of race remains as a part of the belief system. Um, I think it's important for us not to minimize the structural. There are certain things in place. There are certain neighborhood uh, decisions that get made around zoning and you know, who goes to which school. I mean, those are real structural barriers. But I also want to say that um, the symbolic is with us in ways that it's hard to even kind of sort out. It's almost a chicken and egg kind of question, which came first, that we put these things together structurally, or were we symbolically uh, arguing about race and um, equality? Did the pre-existing structures create the symbolic language and the beliefs about race, or did the symbolic language and beliefs precipitate structures that maintain racial inequality? And I guess it's maybe a coward's way out that I argue that the two of them, the structural and the symbolic, are interactive. In the United States, the society was both uh, building a nation that included the economic, the political, the social and cultural components, and building an ideology. We're doing both of those things. And race was an important part of both projects. And it came to have salience in both of those arenas. Um, I'm looking at the clock, so I want to make sure. Again. So my argument is that we need to, at some point, work to defund race, despite its impossibility. And the impossibility is linked to the fact that we often have to use it. You have to use the, the, the language of race to defund it. It's not like we can't say it anymore. We still have to say it. We still have to have the conversations about race. Um, but I'm as I said at the lunch gathering, I'm uh, encouraged by the work of uh, Derek Bell. Derek has been such a special person in my life um, since I started doing this work. He's encouraged me. Um, I was devastated when he uh, unexpectedly died. Uh, but his, his point is that just because something is impossible 
doesn't mean it's not worth doing. And as I shared with those of you who are at lunch, you know, if I look over the four generations of my own life, my great-grandparents were born into slavery. And slavery was impossible. You, you got up every morning as a slave. You went to bed every night as a slave. But somebody still said, I'm going to work against it. I know it's impossible. I'm going to still work against it. My grandparents on both sides are sharecroppers. It's a rigged system. You can never get ahead as a sharecropper. You can never make any money. You can never own property. You just work. It's another form of slavery. It was impossible. But somebody decided, I'm going to still try to work against this. If it means migrating to the north, then that's what I'm going to do. But I'm going to work against it. My own parents grew up in Jim Crow, state-sponsored apartheid, legal segregation. My mother could not try on a hat in a department store. She wanted it, she had to buy it and take it home, and it was hers. If she didn't like it, too bad. And that was impossible. But somebody said, you know what, we're still going to work against this. So to come from slaves to sharecroppers to people in Jim Crow uh, South to be an endowed professor, all those impossibilities, Give me some sense of hope. Give me some sense of um, the terrain of what in which I have to work. And so I am convinced that we still have to keep doing the work. Even when the results don't seem that um, evident, we have to do this work because we don't have any other choice. There is no way for us to survive or thrive, continuing to dehumanize large portions of the society. We're not going to be less uh, brown or black or red or yellow. We're going to be more. And the question is, how do we work together to ensure that the, the things that we claim to, to have in common, the notion of democracy, the notion of people being created equal. How do we infuse teachers with a sense of humanity so that when they walk into classrooms, they don't see a group of kids who are incapable. They don't see a group of kids who are not uh, worthy. But they see human beings that are filled with potential, who can literally turn the world upside down because they have minds. They have ideas, and they have thoughts. I think that one of the reasons that we are struggling with doing this is because we've grown comfortable with this idea of race and that it serves our purposes very well. So I'm just going to close by asking you and recruiting you in a campaign that I have to defund it to make it have less meaning, to make it not be a sense-making category, and to help us to move to a place in which our humanity, regardless of where our cultural background is, that our humanity is on full display. I think that is the only way that we could fulfill the promise of democracy. So I'll stop. Thank you. So it's my understanding that people are going to walk to a microphone, okay? So if you have a question, um, please walk to a microphone. If not, I know there's probably questions coming in online too. So we'll... question that we got from Laura Jones. Okay. So she wrote, um, she asks, 
Funding race is such a powerful metaphor, as is the education debt. I wonder if it's not a coincidence that both are metaphors about money. Mm. We know that economics literally underpins so much about race and education, but what, if anything, does it mean that there seems to also be strong metaphorical affinity between economics and education? So uh, it's an excellent question about the way in which uh, both metaphors that I've used have been kind of in the realm of uh, economics. I'm actually just finishing up a paper I have to give in Cleveland a couple, uh, in a couple weeks on the return on investment of early childhood <laughs> education. Uh, but part of it is it's, it's the lingua franca of a capitalist nation. When you start talking about what's in their pockets, they listen to you. And I really kind of worked against trying to appeal to people's sort of benevolence. I've worked, you know, moved away from, oh, you should do this because this is the good or right thing to do. I'm not convinced you can convince enough people to do the good or right thing. Uh, but I can, but people do understand um, dollars and cents. They do understand this notion of, well, how do I benefit in, in, in this particular way? So that may be part of why, uh, uh, that it's an understandable uh, way of appealing to people is through economics. Uh, my own preference would be to appeal to them through culture, but you know, culture is a, is, a, is a tough term to unpack and to have a conversation with people about that it actually means something to them. It, it's become a catch-all. Right? So I have experiences where students will tell me that their students of color act a particular way because of their culture. And I'm like, oh, oh, oh no, that's, that's not about their culture that they're, you know, there's an interaction between maybe how you're treating them and how they're responding. So I think that the, the default to economics is it's become a way to be understandable in a society that places economic value on certain things, on lots of things, in fact, on schools, on neighborhoods, on health care. I mean, we talk in terms of how much things cost. I have a question from Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, what practical advice would you give to teacher educators to infuse a sense of humanity with pre-service teachers and practicing teachers? Um, well, I think the challenge of doing that is that people will want to elide over race. Let's not talk about race. Let's just talk about our humanity. And I, and I think our humanity is a place we want to get to. But I'm not sure we can get to it without having an honest conversation about the way in which we have currently defined humanity. Uh, and we've defined it in racial categories. So, for example, one of the uh, assignments that I gave some students at my uh, the previous institution before I came to Wisconsin was to ask them, um, tell me some things that white people can be proud of. And, oh my gosh, all hell broke loose. Why do we have to be white? Okay, well, I didn't make the designation. <laughs> Why can't we just be Americans? Well, that's really a place we hope to get to. But if you can't talk about what it means to be white, how are you going to have February roll around and ask my kids to tell, them, tell you, tell me some contributions that black people have made? So the asymmetry between the way in which we ask black folks, brown folks, uh, to talk about their experience versus the way in which we ask white students to talk about them is one of those places where uh, we can't get to humanity yet. Uh, I know I've told this story several times, but it's, it's, it's an interesting one. When I first taught a course, on teaching in a multicultural society. At my previous institution, it was listed as an ethnic studies course. So students took it because they had to, have an, they had to meet an ethnic studies requirement. And it had a practicum associated with it. And when the students first came in, every, all of these students were white. Uh, I was probably the first black 
professor or maybe teacher any of them had ever had. And I kind of knew who my students would be, and I began by saying to them, this is going to be a very tough class. It's going to be tough for you, and it's going to be tough for me, because I'm not used to teaching at-risk students. What's she talking about? And for the next five to seven minutes, I kept inserting that phrase, at risk, as I referred to them. I said, you know, I know it's a lot of reading. I know you're at risk, but listen, I'm committed. I'm, I'm going you know, to stick this out. And I kept doing it. So finally, this young man raised his hand, and I said, yes. He said, you know, I'm deeply offended at your constant referral to us as at risk. I said, oh, you are, are you? You've been at risk all of five minutes and you're pissed off. <laughs> I want you to think about that when I send you out to classrooms and people have sent you the most precious possession they have. That's, their best, that's the best third grader that woman has. She didn't have another one in the china closet that she's going to send later if you prove to be okay. This is it. But you're going to put a label of at risk on a five-year-old in kindergarten and expect that five-year-old to carry it for the next 13 years through 12th grade and be successful. You couldn't stand up under it for five minutes. So it's often bringing them back to those places where the children and the students are that in some ways opens people's eyes about, oh, okay, this is what this means. This is how I get to feel this way. Thank you so much for mm -hmm. coming to speak with us today. My um, I'm Ebony Bruce Harvey. I'm in the teaching and teacher education program. And so one thing that stood out to me, because I am a teacher educator and working to become um, a teacher educator, um, you mentioned in your slides and in your t talk that few teacher educators take on race directly. Mm -hmm. So just as thinking about our pedagogy and being teacher educators who want to take these things on, but as you said, it's not easy work. What are some things that you do um, in your work, and what are some things that you suggest that we do when we're afraid to take on those things, whether it's because of who we are as we stand in front of students or because we've never talked about these things before? Um, what are some things to help us start making those first steps to start working on talking about these things that make us so uncomfortable? So I spoke a little bit about this at the, the lunch meeting and the, the power of literature to kind of open up conversations. Uh, a lot of times it's, it, it's hard to take it on because... When you read the social science, you've got to try to figure out, well, am I the bad guy in this study, right? Uh, I often teach Lisa Delpit's work in a graduate course, and the students love it, but then my students go on to teach undergraduates, and they come back and say, they hated that piece. Well, they're not ready for it, for, for one thing. It's, they haven't had a chance to really grow and develop and think about these things. But a good piece of literature in which there's a story in which there's whole contested notions of what it means to be the black person in this story, can be a place where you can start having a conversation. Why do you think this person is feeling this way? Uh, I also think of film as literature, and so I often will have my students look at a film. You know, it, it, my syllabus says readings and viewings. And so you have to go watch the film and try to figure out, well, why, why is this happening? And why, why did this person feel this particular way? Uh, we've had some really powerful conversations about race as played out through the characters in which our students don't feel like, oh, gosh, she's picking on me. Because um, you do have to create a space in which there's a, a degree of psychic safety. Uh, it's not their fault that they grew up in Gross Point, okay? They didn't get to check off a little box in heaven and say, put me down in Gross Point. It is what it is, and as one of my friends said, sometimes it's less, okay? So the degree to which you can convince students to engage is the degree to which they feel safe enough to engage. Um, I often will have them write an essay about the first time they even noticed race. I'm not judging them for not noticing race earlier in their lives. It's, it's very clear that, that, that students of color will tell you right off the bat, hey, it was always there from time I, you know. They've, they've had the experience. 
often for white students, we never talk, we talk about segregation, but we don't talk about the most segregated group of all are white students. They're off somewhere to themselves in their churches, in their neighborhoods, in their schools. And they, their encounter with racial others is often vicarious. They, I turn on the TV. I listen to rap music. I mean, literally no intimate relationship with people who are different from them. I mentioned that uh, there's a TV series on called America to Me that's focused on Oak Park River Forest High School. One of those teachers in that school is one of my teachers. And I think sometimes that the fight is not necessarily with the students. I think the fight is often about the people who are above you. Uh, Jessica Stovall, who's featured in this um, series, got a Fulbright. And she went to New Zealand and looked at what was happening with Maori and uh, white New Zealanders and had powerful insights to share with her school. They won't let her do it. She couldn't, she asked the principal, no, 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 we don't have time for that. We got to work on these test scores. She went to the superintendent. I mean, she literally had to make a school board presentation, asked to be on the agenda of the school board. And still it didn't get her to the place where she could talk to those who are above her. So we're not just interacting with students. We're interacting with their wider circles of people who say that's not so, or no, you don't have to listen to that. Um, so it's a, it's a more complex and nested set of issues that we're, we're coping with. Hello, my name is Amber Sizemore. I'm a doctoral student in science education. Mm -hmm. And a lot of my work here, I'm always thinking back to my work as a high school chemistry teacher. I taught chemistry in the Bronx, where majority of my students were first generation um, Americans from countries like Nigeria, Ghana, also Puerto Rico, Dominican Republic. And a lot of the conversations in science often went to conversations about black and brown people in America. And what is it like to go out and be accosted by a police officer? Or what does it mean to be proud of your natural hair? So what I'm wondering is, in this idea of defunding race, what does that look like from a black teacher to her students of color when you are, one, trying to empower them as people of color, but at the same time you're trying to work for the, whole, the cause of defunding race? How do you do si those simultaneously um, is my question for you. Your question reminds me of an experience I had in February. I was in Baton Rouge, and I um, was doing a STEM professional development. And I asked the question of the group of teachers, about 80 teachers, I said, who in here has seen, and it was mostly black teachers, incidentally, I said, who in here has seen Black Panther? So almost every hand went up. Second question, who in here has used Black Panther in their science uh, or mathematics classes? Nobody. So I literally made them go through a thing where we went, and I, do, I talk STEAM, not STEM, because I think without the arts, none of this makes sense, right? The arts are what humanize us. Um, and so I went through the STEAM acronym, and I said, tell me, list all the instances of science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics that you saw in that film. I mean, we filled the board with things. So then I had a question for the chemistry teachers. I said, if vibranium, was a real element, where would it fit on the periodic chart? They're like, oh, that's a good question. Yes. <laughs> now, why am I asking you that? Because if you're going to move these students, you've got to be in their world to some extent. You don't have to be them. But you have to understand their world. Now, a student who can answer that question understands the periodic chart. Not just memorizing, knowing that, well, is it a gas? Is a liquid? Because the chart is organized conceptually. It's not just random stuff up there, right? And so that's really what you want to know. The other thing that I've tried to get teachers to really focus on, and it's hard, is to give me three to four of the big ideas that govern their discipline. See, I can tell you what the big ideas are in history without which, if you don't understand them, you don't understand history. And unfortunately, most of our kids are still in classrooms where they're getting random bits of information. They rarely think that Tuesday has anything to do with Monday. So as you're working with kids who are coming from all around the world, and chemistry in particular, um, what are the elements 
that Nigeria is really known for. That if you, you know, just went in the natural environment in Nigeria, what are you going to find? If you are out in, um, if you're in Ecuador, what's there? Uh, what's the debate about the, that element that's used in our cell phones? Uh, what's the debate about so-called blood diamonds? So bringing the social with the scientific is one of the things that uh, I think, first of all, get the kids hooked on the scientific. But secondly, um, says to them, she actually cares about me beyond this classroom. She cares more about my, she also cares about my background, what's important to me. Uh, the question that I often start off professional development with is, as a subgroup, which is the best performing subgroup in the United States, in the United States schools? The typical responses are Asian American, or they might be specific and say Chinese American, uh, South Asian Americans. The answer is Nigerians, plain and simple, as a group. Nobody is doing as well as they are. So then the question that I ask teachers is how come that never crossed your mind? Part of that is because race has been funded for you in a way that you could never imagine. But all of these I got into all the Ivies for the last three years. I've all been Nigerian students. So it, the, the thinking beyond the classroom about what kids are, are experiencing is an important part of the work. You know, Bill, I'll never forget Bill Tate's work in Dallas with the kids in the, the liquor stores, where it's a math class, but what the kids are worried about is every day they come in and they get accosted by these people for money to buy liquor. And they do a whole project looking at zoning. And Dallas it was, is divided into wet and dry zones. There are places where you're not allowed to sell liquor in Dallas. It's no surprise that those places are mostly white and the places where liquor can be sold are black. And they did all kinds of work to look at, you know, how have we kind of racialized uh, what's available uh, in, a, in a neighborhood? Um, so I think there, there are so many ways in which you can take what kids' everyday experiences are to incorporate into um, the work that you're doing. Because um, the kids want to know, figure out a connection. They want to know, what does this have to do with anything? And that's really our, our job. It's not their job. We have time for one more? Um, good afternoon, or I guess it might be evening good. now. Charles Wilkes, uh -huh. always a pleasure seeing you. Thank you. Phenomenal presentation. I guess I have two questions, but they're very much connected. Okay. So earlier you mentioned like this idea you've had since 2004. And so I was kind of curious, like now that we've seen the idea, like, and you've um, presented it and it's in the papers, like what, 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 what sparked the weight? And then I'm also thinking about your other paper, the Coach the Relevant, like Remix 2.0, mm -hmm. and thinking about like how ideas get like hijacked from the research side or like they're taken up in ways that you don't intend. In choosing funding and even the, the comment earlier about debt, like what went into that language? I mean, I know you outlaid the literature, but what went into the phrasing? And how do you perceive it? Like, were you intentional about picking it in ways where you didn't think it would get hijacked? And have you already began to get questions or things that make you think about how it can be taken up in ways that you didn't intend for it to originally? Okay. Excellent question. I hope I can answer it. Um, I'll take this back a little further back to the idea that students have often asked me, or young professionals have often asked me, how do you balance it all? Right, because you know everybody know I'm the social media queen. I'm on, I'm on every platform they got. You know, I, I ain't show y'all my Snapchat filters because the little ears and stuff. Uh, but um, I tell them that balance is a fallacy because you have this sense of 50/50. Anybody who's been in a long-term intimate relationship know ain't no such a thing. Okay. Teddy Pendergrass told you that. It ain't 50-50. Sometimes it's 30, 70, right? <laughs> so I stopped trying to be balanced it was, yeah, and started trying to be integrated. How do I get the stuff that I care about? I'm very much a fan of popular culture. How do I get that in the stuff I have to do as a scholar? How do I take the stuff I do as a scholar and put it in my family? How do I do the stuff? 
I do in community and put it in, you know, the academy. So I'm always looking for ways to integrate ideas. And, you know, one of the things that you have to, I think, come to terms with is once you put it out in the atmosphere, you no longer have any control over it with what people decide to do with it. You know, unless you become like Steve Jobs and be start to finish, I'm going to make the, the device, I'm going to make the software, I'm going to make all the peripherals, I'm going to make the operating system. None of the stuff you use is going to work with my stuff because I'm going to be in control of the whole thing. You can't even plug it into something else unless you come back to me and get a little dongle because I'm going to be in charge of all of that. That's rare. Most of us don't have that level of control over ideas. So at some level, the only thing you can do is get the idea out there and then try to find as many examples of replication that really have fidelity to the idea. Uh, trust me, sometimes I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night over culturally relevant pedagogy because you know, when my own daughter went through school, when I go to back to school night, and this dude going to tell me, oh, I've been glad to meet you, you know, because I'm a culturally relevant pedagogue. Like, oh, Jesus, no, you ain't. No, you ain't. You're like the worst teacher she got, you know. But I don't have control over that. Uh, and, you know, the, the comfort for me is that that's not what the teachers themselves called themselves. They believed they were just trying to do good work. I use the term so I can talk to you, so I can talk to colleagues. So in some ways, I don't get too proprietary. I mean, I actually had a woman come up to me to sell me a DVD on culturally relevant pedagogy. I'm like, <laughs> that's like me going up to Kendrick Lamar trying to sell him my mixtape. Like, here, yeah, you know. <laughs> There's just some things you got to kind of let it go. Um, I tend to be a more metaphorical thinker. I tend to make comparisons about stuff. So it's not, you know, the, the debt thing all came about with me coming home from New York City, stuck in traffic at the Triborough Bridge, and I saw that bulletin board, and it had all these numbers, and they were just going like crazy, and it was like, 12 trillion, and it said, this is the national debt, right? And numbers were just going. And then underneath, there were some more numbers, not as big, but it was a big number, and the caption read, and this is your share of it. And I was like, oh, snap. No, I can't pay that. <laughs> no, 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 I can't do that. And I asked myself, why did I feel obligated? And then I realized that that's kind of a theme that had been going through our political discourse about we can't leave our children with this debt. We got to do something with the debt. So that's how I kind of picked up on that. Again, the notion of the social funding came as a result of listening to this guy talk about literacy, that we fully funded even the people who don't want to participate, participate in it. And, I, and it just, what connected in my mind is that's exactly how race operates. People who don't want to participate still participate in it. Um, so, I mean, I, I, what I would say is give your, as a young scholar, give yourself enough space to play with an idea. Um, my last years at Wisconsin, I spent with our hip hop art scholars and they just changed my life. You know, because they made me think about things in a very different way. We were sitting in a class once and I was explaining, uh, Du Bois and double consciousness. And a student just jumped up and said, oh my God, this dude is like Durkheim. And I'm like, what, what you say? <laughs> you know, because she could see something that I couldn't see. Um, that's the beauty of working at places like this. You're gonna always be encountering people with brilliant ideas. And if you're receptive and open to it, if you're not closed off and feeling like it's only got to be the way I say it is, uh, you will grow as a scholar. You will learn. 
uh, in ways that are unimaginable. Uh, I was telling a young lady who was in science education, Wisconsin, we just graduated our first African-American female astrophysicist. But she's also a hip-hop scholar. And when she describes astrophysics to me through her spoken word, I'm like, dead. I'm like, are you serious? Uh, the way she brought that together um, just reminds me of the incredible potential that's out there, you know, and the stuff we could be doing in our work. You know, I think we're not doing a, a fifth, an eighth of what we could be doing because we keep closing stuff off and saying, no, it's only over here. It can only be this. You can only think of it this way. And if anything I'm doing helps people be more expansive in their thinking, then I, I, I feel rewarded in that way. so fantastically lucky to have just spent two hours with you. Thank, Thank you. you so much. As you can see, people are sitting on the edge <laughs> of their seats. Maybe um, because their seats is uncomfortable. How about that? <laughs> it wouldn't make a difference. It wouldn't make a difference. So I just like standing with all these other people just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for thank such an you. incredible um, discussion with us. We've learned so, so much. We're like aching for the paper coming next. I just like thank you all of you. Thank you, Dr. Latson Billings. You. That was really fantastic. Thank you. Um, in two weeks, we'll come back and we'll welcome um, Dr. Marcel Haddix. She'll be here on uh, Monday, September 24th. Take all these ideas, ruminate with them, marinate on them, and like let this be the curriculum that we engage with each other over this entire year so that we can really make some good, good progress together. Thank you. Thank you.